The major party candidates for Philadelphia District Attorney on Inside Story right now. Good morning, everyone. I'm Matt O'Donnell. It is Sunday, November 5th, 2017, and welcome to a special edition of Inside Story where we're going to meet the two major party candidates for Philadelphia District Attorney. To my right, we have Beth Grossman, the Republican candidate. Good morning, Ms. Grossman. Good morning. Happy to be here. And Larry Krasner, the Democratic candidate. Good morning, Mr. Krasner. Good morning. All right, let's get right into this, and we're going to start with restoring dignity to the office that both of you seek. Seth Williams, the last person elected to that office, District Attorney, is now in a jail cell and he's likely going to be there for the next five years for accepting a bribe. And we're going to start with you, Mr. Krasner. Why are you the best person to restore dignity to the office, boost morale amongst the people that still work there, and the investigators? Well, I wouldn't say I'm the best person in the world. I think that there are probably a lot of good people because most of us don't take bribes and most of us are really more interested in doing the right thing than we are in lining our pockets or or having a lot of glory. But I think the way that you have to do this, of course, is to set a standard. And you need to make it very clear to all of your staff that there are no favors, that there are no gifts, that you will not tolerate anything of that sort. You've got to do the kind of thing that Liz Holtzman did in Brooklyn, which was if someone flashed a bag to get a free ride on public transit, they were fired. I mean, you've got to be serious about that. But at a, at a larger level, we have to look also at issues of um, I would say institutional corruption. There are far too many supervisors and a lot of them were made that for reasons having nothing to do with running a good office. They were more social or political on the part of Seth Williams. And also we have to look at things like civil asset forfeiture, which has frankly turned into a form of institutional corruption where people's property is taken without justification. Ms. Grossman, restoring dignity to the office you seek. Certainly. Well, obviously you lead by example and whoever is district attorney and hopefully me, you have to set the highest of ethical standards and again similar to what my opponent said no taking of anything no favors no economic benefits um, you have to have a strict code of conduct nothing will be tolerated um, you can't accept anything economically nor can nor should you do anything with regard to sentencing and offer in cases I think that's very important the other thing is I think if elected DA I would be out there at as many meetings as possible to account what the office is doing to the public because you are serving the public and you need to listen and hear what the public wants out of its district attorney's office. Certain things need to be streamlined there. There are too many supervisors and you have to use, make the most economical use of our budget. Both of you want to be the top law enforcer in the city of Philadelphia, so let's talk about policing. Ms. Grossman, you're going to get the first one here. Police brutality and police safety have always been big issues in law enforcement, but more so today than ever before. So why don't we start out with trying to find a balance. How would you, Ms. Grossman, balance supporting the police in what is a very dangerous job, while also ensuring members of the community are not unduly harassed or even harmed during investigations of crimes or during moments when police have to go out there and try to maintain order? Well, it's first of all, it's very important to have a good working relationship with the Philadelphia Police Department. I certainly have worked over the years with Commissioner Ross as well as Commissioner Ramsey and know a lot of the command staff. But that being said, during my time in the district attorney's office, I have investigated and prosecuted police officers. And let me make clear, nobody is above the law. You know, as for a police officer, whether you're on duty or off duty, if you commit a crime, it will be investigated. And if there is sufficient evidence, he or she will be prosecuted. But also it's important to continue to work with Commissioner Ross to improve trust between communities and the police department, such as continuing to decrease stop and frisk for no reason. That can't be a, you know, that cannot be tolerated. And it's also really working out there, um, joining with the police department and improving and engaging with the community so they understand that there is, there can be trust between the police department and the DA's office. But um, look, officers have to do their job. It is tough. It doesn't always mean that it will rise to a criminal incident. Mr. Krasner, uh, policing balance between the two that I've mentioned? So, <clears throat> you know, in my opinion, the right and conservatives forever have tried to make us think we have an either or situation that somehow holding police officers accountable makes us unsafe. That's a bunch of nonsense. There's absolutely no contradiction between lifting up good police officers by pushing the bad ones out of the way and making us all safer. That's how you make us safer. You have one standard of law that applies to everyone, whether you're rich or not, whether you're famous or not, 
whether you wear a uniform or not, whether you're a politician or not. There has to be one standard. And no one complains when Seth Williams goes to jail, even though he is a law enforcement officer, even though he is a lawyer, because we know that's fair. Well, the same thing applies to police. And to the extent that you do that, you restore trust in the police, you lift up the good ones, and you do that, simply put, by pushing the bad ones out of the way. Mr. Krasner, we're going to talk about stop and frisk, which uh, Ms. Grossman mentioned, and we'll get you a crack on it. How, let me ask it this way. What would you tell members of, the com of a community in Philadelphia, a particular neighborhood, who believe that stop and frisk has made their neighborhood safer and they're willing to accept that as a fact and that as a practice? What would you tell them in saying, well, we're just not going to do it, I'm sorry? Well, what we are going to do is we're going to permit legal I repeat, legal stop and frisk. What we're not going to permit is illegal stop and frisk. And it's not even as if I have a choice. The, the chief prosecutor takes an oath to uphold the Constitution. Illegal stop and frisk violates the Constitution. But I would also say, let's use a little science instead of just use our own anecdotal reasoning. Science is clear. 49 out of 50 times when you do stop and frisk, you find nothing. And when I say nothing, I mean you don't even find that bag of weed that's in the back pocket of some kid. You don't even find that pocket knife that's a little too long. And you only find a gun one out of 400 times. So we have to not just look at what is found. We need to look at the reality that when you do that to 50 kids, 49 of them having done nothing wrong, and you humiliate them because they are in a poor neighborhood where they will be enforced more strictly than they will in Chestnut Hill, what's going to happen is you're going to alienate those 49 kids. And the ones who wanted to be cops don't want to be cops anymore. And the ones who might give information to police to solve homicides are not going to do it anymore. Let me go on to Ms. Grossman on that. Stop and frisk. Sure. You already said that you don't favor it. Well, what I, it has to be done if there is articulable, reasonable suspicion that there is crime, that crime is afoot. It cannot be done for profiling. It cannot be done just to rouse people because that does build distrust in the community. So it's not going to help anything. And we have to uphold the constitutional laws of our nature. That's the way it is. But I think if there is trust built by decrease in stop and frisk, then I think people are going to feel more comfortable actually approaching police officers to say, look, this is going on. Can you do something about it? It. So you sort of have to approach crime fighting in a different way and healing bridges between communities and the police department. Let's talk about crime victims. And as district attorney, you or any of your assistant DAs will be the ones who have to make contact with these people, make them feel safe, make them feel like there's going to be a, a judicious process. Uh, so Ms. Grossman, to a victim of a violent crime, let's say perhaps like a rape, or an aggravated assault, or let's say you're dealing with a relative who lost a uh, family member to a murder, how would the DA's office care for these people? Well, first, in my 21 and a half years as a prosecutor in the DA's office, I have dealt with victims from all walks of life, including young children all the way to senior citizens. So the DA's are trained to speak and treat people with respect. We also have worked, we have wonderful working relationships with amazing victim witness organizations such as Women Organized Against Rape, Women Against Abuse, and our Geographic Victim Witness Services. So they provide services to people in the courtroom as this horrible, you know, trauma has to be relayed when people have to testify. So we sort of work together along with um, victim service providers from the police department. They have victim witness officers. So it's sort of a team approach and we make sure that people get the resources that they need. Mr. Krasner, handling victims of crimes. Well, you know, first of all, I am a victim of crime. I was slashed in the face about 10 years ago in Center City, Philadelphia. I have repeatedly represented victims in my capacity as a private attorney, including right now two little girls whose mother was run over by a drunk driver and killed. Um, so I have very strong feelings about victims being handled properly. And I think a lot of what Ms. Grossman is saying is true, that there have been efforts to do right by victims. But if we look around the country, there's a lot more that can be done. And we need to do a lot more for victims. I should not have had to do the things I had to do as a private attorney to help victims, both in the court and also with things afterwards. And when I did so, I often encountered, frankly, resistance from the district attorney's office in terms of providing paperwork or videos or the things that were necessary to help these little girls get the kind of financial assistance they should have had. So we need to do more, and I think we can do more if we look around the country for good examples. Mr. Krasner, what would you say to a parent in Philadelphia who worries about their child 
being wounded or killed by a police officer under suspicious circumstances? And I also pose that question to Ms. Grossman. Well, as, as many people know, I, didn't, I have worked as a civil rights attorney for almost 25 years, and part of the work that we have done has included, uh, when we thought it was justified, filing lawsuits against police when we believe that there was brutality or there was corruption or someone was being framed for some reason. Um, and we've done that more than 75 times. So number one, I have no reservation about prosecuting people who are in uniform and are intentionally committing crimes. I have no reservation about that. This DA's office for 30 years has sadly been essentially a cover-up organization for uh, improper activity by police officers. It's been that way for reasons that are political, by which I mean all these other DAs who came before me wanted to run for office across the state, and they were more interested in ingratiating themselves to the police union than doing right by the citizens of Philadelphia. So what I would say is, um, we all know that police officers sometimes make a mistake. Well, a mistake's not a crime, but we also know they sometimes commit crimes. And if they commit crimes, they will be treated just as well and just as harshly as anybody who does not have a uniform. Ms. Grossman, parents who worry that their children could actually be put in danger when in contact with police. Well, look, let me make clear, again, as I said before, I have prosecuted police officers and, any poli and investigated police shootings, and if there is a police shooting, it will be investigated. If it rises to a criminal level, an offense, then that officer will indeed be prosecuted. I must object to what my opponent said. The DA's office, I'm proud of my 21 years there. He may think it's a corrupt organization, but listen, he took Mr. Jack McMahon, who ran for DA as a Republican with him, when he wanted to address the FOP. So if you're saying it's been corrupt for 30 years, that's who you took with you, and I find that hypocritical. Let me turn this question around. And we'll start with Ms. Grossman. What do you say to the spouse of a Philadelphia police officer who worries that a split-second decision by that officer may end up costing that officer his life, costing him his job, costing his reputation, and is it fair that we are able to debate that split-second decision for days weeks, months, years. It is a very, very difficult thing when it comes to a police shooting because none of us have been in that situation. I'm obviously going to assume you haven't. And it is a life or death split second thing. And one of the worst days of my role as a prosecutor was it's going to the scene with internal affairs when Sergeant Steven Lisbinski was murdered and was gunned down by an assailant. So, you know, it is a very nerve wracking thing for a spouse when his or her, you know, spouse leaves to go to work as a police officer. And, you know, all I could say is with um, police shootings, I will tell spouses as well as officers themselves that they, that a police shooting will be looked at fairly and appropriately and they will not be made an example of just because they are police officers. Mr. Krasner, split second decision. I mean, it's very simple. The, there's one standard for everybody. We evaluate split second decisions for people who have uniforms and don't have uniforms and we take into account things like why they are there. If you are on location with a gun because you are a police officer, that is obviously a factor in your favor. But there aren't two standards here. There isn't the police get the benefit of every doubt and no one else does. Standard. We have to be even handed. We are endangering police officers by decreasing trust, by having a DA's office that has historically covered up when there was a crime. All right? We can be even handed. It's not that hard. And by doing so, we elevate the good officers. We make them safer because we increase trust. I think we have time for one more question before the break. I want to ask you about the Ferguson effect. I'm sure both of you know exactly what I mean. It was mentioned by former FBI Director James Comey as a possible reason why some cities are seeing increases in crime as police maybe are backing off. Some people think it's happening in Chicago. Uh, do you believe, Mr. Krasner, that there is a Ferguson effect in this country? Do I believe that police officers are refusing to respond to emergencies? Is, I mean, is that the question? I can't imagine that, that good police officers would refuse to do their duty when they're paid by taxpayers. And I don't think that Comey has a whole lot of credibility in any regard, for a lot of reasons we probably re uh, remember from, from the last uh, election. Ms. Grossman. Well, from just speaking to various people during the course of this campaign, I do think that some police officers here will have some hesitation to do their jobs in light of my opponent having sued the police department in over 75 times. And I think there is some fear and trepidation that they will be made examples of and prosecuted because they are police officers. May I respond to that? I'll let you respond then. And if you'd like to respond as well, uh, I'll give you... 20 seconds. I think it's pretty irresponsible to suggest to police officers who are paid by the public, by the taxpayers, that it's okay at any level 
for them to decide that they're going to do or not do their duty because of some, frankly, phony message about what it is that the district attorney might do. Ms. Grossman? You can't kidnap a city. Would you like to respond? Well, I certainly hope that that is not the case because everybody deserves to be safe in their neighborhoods. More questions for the candidates for Philadelphia District Attorney when we come back. 6ABC's Inside Story is presented by Temple University. 